time and it's great to have this chat with you as a taster for um to your talk for the next club day in november um i loved your ted talk you did in tauranga it's such a fascinating area of research we're fortunate to have a renowned microbiologist here at massey university uh what led you to albany all the way from california yeah it's it's a it's a long story <laughs> But the I'll tell you the short version, and that is um, I was a high school student in California, and but my family was originally from Utah, which is the beehive state in uh, the US, as it turns out. And um, so I uh, had had um, strong family ties to Utah, and I went to Utah as an undergraduate. And there I worked in a microbiology laboratory on uh, evolution. And after my time as an undergraduate at uh, the University of Utah, I joined a laboratory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as a PhD student. And that was where I first got my um, first real exposures to bacteriophages. And bacteriophages are the tiny viruses that can infect bacteria. And that's a lot of what we'll talk about today and a lot of what we'll talk about in November. Um, so I uh, got to know the people at the Pittsburgh Bacteriophage Institute, and one of the senior professors there was from England and suggested that for my postdoctoral work, I have to look at someone at the University of Oxford. And so I eventually got a Human Frontier of Science program fellowship and moved to the biochemistry department in Oxford and did three and a half years of research there before um, joining Massey University as a lecturer and working in the laboratory of a really famous evolutionary microbiologist named um, Professor Paul Rainey, who is now in France uh, and has a laboratory in Germany. Um, but in the meantime, I've taken a permanent position at Massey Albany, and I've been here for 10 years now. But actually, in January, my laboratory will be moving to um, Canterbury. So the University of Canterbury has offered me a position as a, a senior lecturer in microbiology, and so I'll be, I'll be moving very soon. Oh, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> it's nice to have you here for 10 years while well, we did. Um, so what exactly is your area of study and how does it affect beekeepers? So my laboratory works on two different things. We're interested in how bacteria evolve in response to their predators. Um, and when I say predators in that context, we're really talking about these single cell eukaryotic amoeba that eat them on surfaces. And so we're interested in how the exposure to those types of organisms in the soil might affect their evolution. Does it make them more um, likely to become pathogens? Does it make them more likely to start cooperative relationships? So those sorts of things, so that's half the laboratory. The other half of the laboratory works on bacteriophages, which as I said, are these viruses that infect bacteria. And about four years ago now, we decided that um, after having done some undergraduate projects with uh, phage finding, that it would be really great if we found and applied um, some application for bacteriophages in New Zealand that hasn't been um, tried yet, but that has evidence overseas. And so we settled on the Pennybacillus larvae organism, which causes American foul brood. And we've spent the last three years discovering bacteriophages here in New Zealand that are able to infect and destroy American foul brood um, causing um, organisms before they're able to infect uh, the bee larvae. So that's, that's how we've gotten into thinking more about honeybees. Wow, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> good luck with that. Um, <laughs> So is your study of bacteriophages related to the use of viruses by some Eastern European countries instead of antibiotics? Yes. So um, bacteriophages were discovered um, about over 100 years ago now. And uh, in places in Russia and um, Poland and Georgia and a little bit in France, they were used at one point um, as medicines. So they were used instead of antibiotics. So as antibiotics were being developed in England and in the West, 
um, bacteriophages were being um, used in some of those same ways in um, these sort of Eastern Bloc uh, countries. And as a result of that, um, we ended up with these two different types of technologies that have different um, advantages. One of the advantages of trying to use bacteriophages is that there are more bacteriophages on Earth than anything else. So there are 10 to the 31 of them, which is this just like astronomically big number. They're all over us. So you are covered with bacteriophages right now. There are bacteriophages in the, um, in the milk that we drink, in the water that we drink, in the food that we eat, uh, all over us, inside of us. We are just um, surrounded by these tiny viruses and they're incredibly diverse. And the cool thing about them is that they tend to have specific hosts that they infect. So if we take an antibiotic, um, it can destroy a lot of the, the good bacteria in our gut. And also then there's a tendency for those bacteria to evolve resistance to those um, antibiotics. But if we um, use a bacteriophage in the same way, it's only going to kill the bacteria that it are, is able to infect and it's gonna leave the rest of them alone. So it's actually this very natural way of hurting something that's an enemy while preserving the things that are, are good for um, guts of organisms and hosts and, and uh, protecting some of that diversity. Hmm. Thank you. Is there any way that citizen scientists can help in the search for bacteriophages? Citizen science has been an incredibly important part of our um, hunt for bacteriophages in New Zealand so far. So we, um, as me and my PhD student and my master's student who've been working on the ABATE project, which is the Active Bacteriophages for AFB Eradication um, project, we do not have access to um, beehives. I'm not a beekeeper and my student's not a beekeeper. And uh, as it turns out, in our hunt, healthy beehives has been the place where we have found these um, bacteriophages so far. So in some of our healthy beehives, we already have these bacteriophages kind of standing guard um, and protecting the beehives against uh, incursions by this Penibacillus larvae organism that causes American foul brood. So um, in order to get access to soil and bee debris samples from hives across the country, uh, we've actually used a citizen science approach. So we put out a call, we had a, um, a little infographic that we passed out at the Apiculture and Zed conference, and we sent it around to a bunch of beekeeping clubs like the Auckland Beekeeping Club. And um, that way uh, we had people suggest that they would like to send us samples and we sent them prepaid envelopes uh, with sample tubes so that they could send us soil samples that we could then search for bacteriophages. And in this project over the last three years, we had, I think over 430 samples sent to us from across New Zealand, um, the North Island and the South Island. And we ended up finding um, 33 bacteriophages that we've just sequenced. And I'll be able to talk a little bit about what we've named them or what people who've helped discover them have named them and um, what their genomes are like uh, when I talk to your club. So Excellent. it's been you, absolutely crucial. Excellent. Are you still looking for um, samples or is that so yeah, someone so could we, send in a sample and if they discovered it, they could name it after themselves. That's right. Yeah. So we're going to be putting out another call for um, phages, I think, in um, 2022. We'll get in touch with people and say, you know, we'd love to take soil samples at this point. Uh, we have found bacteriophages that are really good in infecting a couple or most of the bacterial strains that we have um, from New Zealand. So we have a sampling of about 30 um, strains of this pathogen, this AFB causing pathogen. But the, we found two of those 30 that we haven't been able to find any bacteriophages that, they're, uh, that are able to infect them. So we're still on the hunt for, you know, we got to take down those two so that we can come up with a combination of these bacteriophages that we could put into a hive and whatever bacterial pathogen showed up in that hive, those bacteriophages would be ready for that fight. So we want to make sure that we have the whole um, diversity of the pathogens covered. Hmm. How much of an issue is the use of antibiotics in agriculture and will it inevitably cause complete antibiotic resistance? So bacteria in uh, the environment, so I'm, I'm a microbiologist, I, I love bacteria, but one of the things that I've studied during my career is how bacteria can exchange pieces of genetic information. And and because bacteria have been battling for resources 
for um, probably 3 billion years on this planet, they have invented a lot of antibiotics and they have encountered a lot of antibiotics that other organisms like mold or um, yeast or other types of organisms have made in order to kill them. So there's an ongoing battle, chemical battle happening all around us um, that involves you know, bacteria on the one hand trying to defend themselves and other organisms uh, trying to make sure that the bacteria aren't stealing their stuff or eating their food or whatever. And, and then you know, we came into this fray and, and chose some of these antibiotics and produced huge amounts of them and started using them maybe a little indiscriminately sometimes. And the bacteria are, are one, very fast um, in terms of their evolution, and two, have the ability to trade pieces of genetic material between them in order to make sure that they have all of the tools that they need to fight the battles that they're up against. So this process of bacteria evolving on the one hand and then acquiring antibiotic resistance is happening around us all the time. And the more we use antibiotics, the more we make the antibiotic resistance genes um, favored in the environment. So we're, we, by using antibiotics in agriculture, we really drive more resistance. And that's a process that we can't stop. Um, by the same token, uh, bacteria will also evolve resistance to things like bacteriophages. But because there are 10 to the 31 bacteriophages on the planet, and only maybe like 20 flavors of, of uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials, I think uh, the likelihood that we can find combinations of bacteriophages that we can use to combat um, bacteria is, a, is a really good. I think the numbers are on our side when it comes to the using phages in, in things like agriculture. Mm -hmm. So do you think that bac um, bacteriophages will be, will be utilizing them much more in the future and they'll be taking over from the antibiotics? I would love that, right? Like I, I have a lot of... Um, I have a lot of I have a lot of hope for the field of uh, bacteriophages and them being used in medicine and agriculture. I think it's an incredibly uh, exciting area of research in the future. I think there will be opportunities for us to use these things in combination. There has been research uh, that suggests that there are certain types of bacteriophages that if you use them, they make the bacteria um, more uh, sensitive to antibiotics that they might not otherwise be sensitive to. So there are nice places where these will synthesize well. And those are also areas that are worth um, studying in the future. So I would love to see us um, getting more into this field of um, bacteriophage research, uh, that's something that I mentioned, of course, in my grants that like if we start getting both the mental um, and physical infrastructure here in New Zealand to do something like produce bacteriophages to protect beehives against something like AFB, those same resources are things that we can use in the future, um, both in terms of people and in terms of physical infrastructure to do the same types of um, problem solving for other parts of industry, other parts of agriculture, but also getting into um, producing bacteriophages that we can use in medicine. So I think um, this is the sort of project and the sort of, you know, um, key to getting us into solving these types of problems and other types of problems with bacteriophages in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. It's very nice to talk to you and I look forward to meeting you in November. Hopefully we'll be having a face-to-face -face club meeting then. And it's fingers crossed. very, fingers crossed, very great to, all the um, stuff that you're doing to help us beekeepers. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And we'll um, see you in November. Thanks again, Ken. Thank you.